I mean, most of you probably know the the, uh, the backstory that we, for a period of time, were intending to make a uh, a feature film adaptation of the Halo video game. Yeah. And we were developing that. It was a Universal and Fox co-production, and we were developing it with Mary Parent, um, who is the executive at Universal that we worked with with Kong, had a great relationship, and. And, um, and the idea was that we would produce it um, d down in New Zealand, we'd use the Weta uh, visual effects companies that we have. But we wanted, from the very beginning with Halo, um, we wanted to find a, a new director, somebody who was fresh, original, that would bring a really interesting spin to the film. I just wanted someone to, that would make a film that would excite me and be a version of Halo that I'd be interested in seeing. And Mary called up one day, and said that she was sending us a DVD of some short movies and commercials made by this exciting filmmaker that she had uncovered. And um, it was Neil. And Neil had done a couple of short movies, a bunch of commercials, and this DVD arrived and we were suitably impressed, I mean really impressed by what we saw. And Mary immediately jumped on a plane with Neil, flew down to New Zealand. We were just putting the finishing touches to King Kong at the time. I, I was directing The Lovely Bones next, which is why I was producing Halo. Um, and, and, but, you know, Neil, we thought, would be absolutely terrific choice to, to direct it. So Neil came, shifted down to New Zealand with his partner and, and child, and basically, you know, became a New Zealander for several months. And then Halo just suddenly um, basically died, dropped dead on its feet due to studio politics. Um, nothing to do with, with Neil or the project. We hadn't delivered a script yet. We hadn't delivered a budget. There was just this weird political situation that we was outside of our control that was happening, and basically the film sort of dropped dead on its feet, which is a pretty horrible thing because you've committed emotionally to a film, you've got excited about it, you really, you know, this is a movie you want to see badly, and Neil was doing a terrific job with conceptual art, with monsters, with creatures. We've got all this Halo stuff down in New Zealand locked away in, in cabinets that no one's ever seen, which is really kind of quite stunning all supervised by Neil, and then the movie fell over and we got kind of disillusioned um, with what happened. And we also felt terrible because we were, you know, trying to godfather the movie and, um, and help Neil get his first feature film made, and this is what happened. The whole thing died. I mean, God, how bad do you feel when that happens? It's like, well, this is as good as we could do was to, you know, help him on a film that never got made. So. We immediately thought, well, why don't we just try to take control of the situation in whatever way we're able to? And we suggested the idea of, of working on an original idea, something we could own, that we weren't beholden to studio politics, keep the budget low, we can hopefully raise the money independently, and let's just turn this whole creative energy that was you know, being spent on Halo, put it directly into a different project. And Neil had made a short film called Alive in Joburg, which you can see on, um, is available on YouTube and, and various websites and it was a really terrific idea that we thought would make a great feature film and um, Neil and Fran and myself um, started working on just ideas to flesh out Alive in Joburg into a feature length and that was really the genesis of District 9. I mean it happened very quickly. We woke up in the morning thinking we were making Halo and went to bed that night making District 9, it was like a sudden switch around. But, you know, fate determined that that was what was going to happen. I, I really believe in fate, and here we are with District 9, a film we're very, very proud of. Well, the, the inspiration for, for the aliens, and just for all of the, the, the science fiction aspects in the film in general, um, I think, I think it's, it's a whole bunch of science fiction floating around in my head from the time I was a kid. It's like all of, you know, probably your favorite films as well that are in that genre, and mine have just kind of been brewing and, and kind of flowing around in my, in my head. And um, the, the fact that I was so aware of wanting to put that kind of sci-fi in Africa meant that I, I, to a certain extent, wanted some of the science fiction to feel like, or on a design basis, feel kind of familiar. Almost like the South African portion of it is the alien part, and the science fiction is something that we've seen before, in a way. So, in terms of the hardware, like the ships and the guns and the, the, the vehicles and stuff, that's where, that's where the design cues came from. But the aliens themselves, 
where, where, where all of the ideas come from in terms of visual design there was that they were insects, and the reason they were insects in design is because in the movie they kind of have this, we don't really go into it that much in the film. I, w I wish there was a way to go into more of the backstory of District 9 because it's such a rich, sort of dense universe, but the idea is that the, the aliens are really like an insect hive, and they've kind of lost their queen and their upper echelons of society, and they're kind of aimless and, and, and sort of they don't have any guided direction because they are the drones. They, they are these kind of like biological drones, like termites or ants. And I really wanted that. And when I, you know, if that's, if, if that's what these aliens are on a biological standpoint, forgetting about any analogies to, to apartheid or anything else, then they're insects. And so I just started going down the road of, of designing them as insects. And yeah, so now they, they look like insects. Um. I mean, my experience on, on District 9 was really terrific because I just felt that my job, my role that I was playing in a way was helping Neil get his film made. I mean, he's the author of the movie. And, you know, there's no point me trying to have Neil make my movie by proxy because I may as well do it myself. And, you know, that wasn't the intent here because I really believe that Neil's a terrifically exciting filmmaker and is going to, you know, make a lot of cool films in the future and that I, you know, I saw my role as one in helping facilitate get, getting that first film made. I mean, now that Neil's got his first film made, if it does well, he, he doesn't need me anymore. You know, I've done my bit, I've sort of explained. I'll always need you, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, um, so really, I mean, what I tried to do really was just keep throwing ideas at Neil. Some of them were creative, some of them were based on experience, you know, telling him what to expect, what he might find, just things, anything I could think of that would be helpful to him. And whenever I was giving him ideas or suggestions or thoughts, you know, I always let him have the final decision. And, you know, the, the movie is very different to a movie I'd have made. If I'd taken that, if I'd use that same premise and made a film, I wouldn't have made this film. So this movie is definitely authored by Neil, but I'm incredibly proud to have my name on it. It's a terrific movie. And um, so I, I, you know, I'm very happy with the role that I played. Very, very happy indeed.